Hello, my name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software. Welcome to SQL Bits and welcome to my session. The session today is entitled, Yes, You Should Monitor Azure SQL Database. Let's talk about it. The goals today are pretty clear. Um, I want to talk to you about why you should monitor your SQL, Azure SQL Database. Yeah, I get it. They're controlled by Microsoft. Therefore, you don't need to worry about anything. But you pay for it, so you might want to know what's going on on that system. We're going to talk about the metrics that you can use to monitor in Azure, and we're going to talk about some of the tooling that you can use to monitor in Azure. All the different ways that you can get a look-see into what's going on inside your Azure SQL database. My name is Grant Fritchie, as I've already said. I'm the DevOps advocate for Redgate Software. I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I'm an AWS community builder. If you have questions after today, I want to try to help. So this is my contact information. Please use it. Get in touch with me, and I will try to help out if I can. I live for questions, so don't hesitate to ask. Um, I need those questions like I need food or air. So it's very important you ask your questions, and I will do my best to answer them for you. So, knowledge is power, right? That's fundamental to almost everything we do. If you know something, you're better off than if you don't know something. So monitoring is all about knowing something. How did my system behave? Did my system behave normally? Did my system behave not normally? Knowledge is power. Knowing how your system is behaving is better than not knowing how your system behaves. So we have to have that knowledge. We have to track it down. That's just fundamental to getting this job done. Also, we need to know whether or not the database is online. Just because it's on the cloud does not mean it's always going to be there. It might not be. We've got to have mechanisms in place that are going to allow us to track whether or not it's there. Or if it's there, has it failed over to some other of, um, geographic location? If, you, if you're doing the, the, the geo-replication, um, we need to know whether or not the things are online. There may be errors. It, it's not just because you've moved to the cloud does not mean you've eliminated the concept of errors inside your database. You have not. There are still going to be errors that occur, and you're going to need to know how to track those down. You can't get away from the concept of errors in, in SQL Server or errors in Azure SQL Database. Errors are going to occur. We also need to know, what does performance look like? We're paying for performance. We are literally paying for performance in Azure. More money means more DTU or more vCPU. Therefore, higher performance. More money means better disks. Therefore, more performance. But what if you want to spend less money? Well, we need to have some kind of knowledge of the behavior of the systems in order to then identify where our pain points are, where the performance problems are, and then how to address those performance issues. We need a way to have immediate information on performance. What is happening now? We also have to have a way of having historical information about our servers. So all of this is our ability to gather information about the behavior of the system in order to understand it and to have knowledge of it. This does not change whether we're talking an on-premises instance or we're talking a managed instance, a VM, a VM in the cloud, or Azure SQL database. Just because it's a platform as a service, all of this is still applicable. None of this goes away. Monitoring is necessary. Gathering information about the system is vital. There is just so much that we have to have, and we have to have a way to put it together. Now, you're not monitoring in the same way we used to. You don't monitor for um, disk space, for example. Yeah, you do want to monitor for database size, but you're not worried about disk space because, in fact, that's pretty much unlimited. It's just largely a question of what you want to pay for more than anything. So we're not monitoring for that. 
we're not monitoring for traditional memory usage. We're not monitoring for traditional CPU usage. Yes, memory usage, yes, CPU usage matters, but they're no longer the traditional metrics that we're looking at. We're certainly not sweating silly stuff, page life expectancy or other things like that. But fundamentally, all of the knowledge that we used to have to need, is my system available? We need to know that still. Are there errors being generated on my system? We need to know that still. What does performance look like on the system? We need to know that still. None of this changes because it's all fundamental to the basis of our knowledge, to the building blocks that are going to allow us to decide to scale up, scale down our Azure SQL database instance, or do whatever it is that we need to do. So without all of this knowledge, we cannot support our systems properly. So you have to gather information on Azure SQL Database. It, it is a necessary task to what we do. It's just fundamental. There's no getting around it. Also, it acts as a mechanism of cost control. The more we can understand what's going on in the system, the more we can control it and not have to sweat it. So that's why we definitely need to start the idea of monitoring as a basis of knowledge. <clears throat> now there are key architectural differences and you need to know that. They are completely different. So it's not, you know, yes, we need to monitor. Yes, yes, yes. But we need to recognize where we are. And the first thing I would effectively point out is that Hardware doesn't matter. You're not looking at hardware anymore. You shouldn't be thinking about hardware. Now, in fact, most of us are probably working inside of VMs these days, which means, again, hardware is not your principal concern. But certainly, when we talk about a platform as a service offering like Azure SQL Database, hardware, to all intents and purposes, doesn't exist. There is simply the service itself. And so you've got to deal with that fact up front. Um, a lot of people are migrating to Azure SQL Database now. It's not like it used to be where, that, where it was a fairly rare thing that people were moving to platform as a service. More and more and more people are going on to this now. It is a growing phenomenon. And I frankly support it and, and advocate for it because I think it's a great way to manage databases, frankly. But you do need to be aware that you're only going to get what Microsoft gives you. You cannot walk in saying like, well, I expect to be able to do X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z are not available. You can only get what Microsoft gives you, and that's, that's just fundamental to the issue. It's not bad. It's not that you need to sweat it necessarily. You're not in a panic mode because you're only getting what Microsoft gives you. Microsoft gives us a lot. We get a lot of information. It's not at all you know, a, a lack of data. It's just knowing where to go and get that information that makes a difference now. So that's the big thing. The good news is, <laughs> the good news is, you know most of the tools. There are not that many tools that are radically different. There is the portal, and we'll be taking a look at it. But other than that, we're using a lot of the tools already. Now there is one tool that most of you are using today that you cannot use in Azure. Um, I'll talk about it when I get to it, but um, there, you know, it, 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 that causes lots of problems for people and I, I just don't know why, but it does. Anyway, the other thing you need to be thinking about all the time is this is in the cloud. Now, performance metrics when we're talking about queries and query tuning, your principal mechanisms are always going to be at the database level. Can I tune this query to run faster? But the fact is, is because this is on the cloud, because this is out on the internet, this is, this is somewhere else out in the world, depending on how we're doing our data movement, it matters. Data movement within an Azure um, data center cool. It, it, it's going to be very, very, very fast. You're not going to need to worry about it. And, and actually, you can actually pay more money to get things closer together inside the data center to ensure that, you know, you've got even less latency there. But 
inside the data center, you kind of don't need to sweat that much for most of us. It's as we move out of the data center, as we start talking about querying data down or trying to put data up into Azure, the performance changes pretty radically because of the internet, because of the latency, because of the movement across the wire or you know, wireless even. Those things all make a difference. So these architectural differences are the very first things to wrap your head around and get on top of. The hardware just isn't there. You know what I mean? It's just not like it used to be. Don't think about it. Just don't, just walk away. Just, just forget about the idea of, of hardware and focus on the information that we do have. That's the best way to deal with this. It really is. I mean, rather than, well, I, I don't have this and I don't have that. So it means I can't do this and I can't do that. It, it's, it's just the wrong way to, to approach the issue. The, the best way to approach the issue is simply go like, okay, I'm here, what do I have? And based on what I have, can I make the decisions I need to make? Can I achieve the understanding I need to achieve? Can I gather the knowledge I need to gather? And the simple answer is yes. Most of it you can. There may be little bits and pieces at the edge where you're going like, gosh, I only wish Microsoft would tell us this and I would feel so much better about life. Maybe they will if we ask them, but most of the time they're not going to tell you everything you want. They're just going to tell you what you need. And most of what you need is available. So making sure that you've got that, that architectural difference in hand as step one will make a big difference in everything that you do going forward. Now, Azure SQL Database is a platform as a service. It just is. Key, key point, it's a platform as a service. Platform as a service means you don't get everything. And that's a good thing. You're not managing a machine, which is a good thing. You're not paying for electricity. You're not paying for space to store it. You are simply paying for a database makes sense. It's easier. You're not worrying about an operating system. It's a platform. You don't have to upgrade the operating system. You don't have to make changes to it. It's a platform. You just deal with that as it is. You also are not worrying about upgrading your SQL Server instances. They will get upgraded for you. So there's a whole bunch of elimination of worries, of concerns, of work with the idea of a platform as a service. And instead, you're going to drill down and focus. And you're going to focus intensely on a simple, simple concept. And that simple concept is that you are only managing the database and the database internals that make that up. That's all you have to worry about is the database and the internals. So it makes a huge, huge difference. Now, most of it, most of the time, most of us will be working with uh, a single database, as I've already said, Azure SQL Database. But some of us may be working with Elastic Pools. Now, the Elastic Pools have a there's a a little bit of a, a misnomer in what they do. They're not really about load balancing. They are more about the idea of fixed cost management and then elastic use within that fixed cost. So there's going to be some additional monitoring in and around the elastic pools to keep an idea, um, an idea of what's going on with the pool as opposed to databases. Because most of the time when you're talking Azure SQL database, we are talking single databases by and large. Um, I, and that's even if we're talking, you know, with the geo replication or any of that stuff, it's still a database and that's where your focus is. And it doesn't matter that if you have a hundred or a thousand databases, you need to think about the platform as a service as a single database. It is one database. It is one thing. It's not more than one thing. It's, it's only what it is, right? And, and that's that it is a, a single database. Now, what we're not talking about today is the managed instance. I'm not going to cover that in great detail. Um, largely, but not completely. <laughs> Again, not completely. When talking about managed instance, you need to think about them more like um, a VM. It's, the, it's, it, it's not a completely accurate, right? They are not VMs. They are absolutely not VMs. You're still 
again, dealing with a service, and therefore you're not dealing with hardware and operating systems. You're only dealing with SQL Server, but you're also not dealing with SQL Server a SQL Server instance. You're, but you are kind of dealing with a SQL Server instance. So it, it's, it gets into this odd balancing act when, we, when we're talking about managed instances. But um, I'm not going to address them a lot today because the, the differences there are much more small, much more subtle, um, not huge like they are monitoring a SQL Server instance versus Azure SQL Database. So I like to focus on Azure SQL Database as a mechanism um, rather than worrying about um, managed instances, just because for me, um, managed instances aren't quite as exciting. Um, it's it's um, more of a thing that Microsoft put together for lift and shift. Um, they wanted more people on Azure, so they wanted to make it easier to get there. And the way to make it easy to get there um, obviously VMs, but VMs aren't exciting. Um, Platform as a service is, is exciting in general. So making an instance as a service, managed instance, um, made lift and shift easier. Um, cross database joins, one of the big, big, big problems with Azure SQL Database, is fixed inside of managed instance because you are looking at an instance, not simply a database. Therefore, as an instance, even though it's a managed instance, you've got the ability to do cross-database querying. So that's cool. Um, no issues there. I'm not throwing rocks at it. Managed instance is fine. It's just not exciting for me. So I just don't want to focus on it. Now, the beauty of it, though, is most of the knowledge that you have for SQL Server is going to translate to managed instance almost completely. So that makes things easy. It's Azure SQL Database where you've got to spend a little more time learning stuff and, and getting over the hurdle of the differences in the behavior. So that's, that's that. Now, one of the things that we are most concerned about when we're talking about monitoring um, Azure is cost. Depending on how you set things up, depending on what you do, depending on how you do it, Frankly, Azure can be more expensive than running things locally. That's not the advertising message, and I get that, that that's not the advertising message, and I'm not picking on Microsoft. I am a gigantic Azure advocate and have been for 10, 11 years now, quite a while. Um, I, I started, I, I recognized what Azure SQL Database was moment one. Um, when they first introduced it, I got real excited because I thought, oh my gosh, I see where this is going and it's fantastic. And um, over the years now, I've seen where it's gone and hey, it's fantastic. But you pay for it. So you need to make sure that you are monitoring for your DTU or vCore, whichever one it is that you're choosing to pay for. You need to keep an eye on it because... Sure, you can just pay more and things will perform better, right? Throw more DTU at it, throw more vCores at it, and things will get better. Things will get faster. But then you pay more. And that's where a lot of people are hitting issues. Now, I have found, um, I talked to a couple of friends who, who've moved to Azure several years back, and they're saying flat out, you know, we can get better performance in Azure than we can get locally. I'm sure there are arguments to be had around that, and, and I don't want to start that fight. But what I'm saying is, is that with appropriate tuning, you can make Azure run pretty quick. Now, again, my friend said this. I didn't. Um, I'm quoting. Don't throw rocks at me. <laughs> but uh, the one thing you do have to do is you've got to keep an eye on the DTUs and the vCore. You've got to watch those. Those are those are vital. Also, the geo-replication costs. Um, are built right into everything else that you're doing, and that has additional overhead and additional costs. So this is the billing area that we need to keep an eye on. That's just fundamentally something that gets built into monitoring now that didn't used to. We didn't used to have to worry about this, but but now it's part of what we're doing. So just make sure you take that into account. Um, we never monitored for we never monitored for cost. Before, we just monitored for 
um, performance and behavior and uptime or downtime. But now we're actually monitoring for cost as well. So just keep an eye on that. Um, it has to be part of your process and part of what you do. So metrics and measures. Here's what we're going to use, right? First up, the big thing that you're going to use is not on the list here, and that's the portal. Um, we're going to spend a bunch of time in the portal, take a look at it, and talk about it. But um, the portal has a whole bunch of stuff in it, and we're going to walk through a, a lot of it and cover it. But the key things that you're going to keep an eye on are these. These four are the tools that we're going to want to use. Now, Systemd DB Resource Stats shows resource usage over time. And this is how we can keep an eye on our billing information. Because it's going to show us the behavior of, of um, our system over time. And, we, and you'll, see, you'll see what it does when we go in and look at the queries. The other thing we're going to look at is Systeme DB weight stats. Now, Systeme DB weight stats is just like Systeme OS weight stats, but it's for Azure. And it's focused on your database. So what are the weights on the database itself. Um, a huge tool, just as SysDMOS weight stats was on an on-premises SQL Server instance, SysDMDB weight stats is inside of Azure. So that's a big thing you're going to be using. The next thing we're going to use is Query Store. If you're not using Query Store today, on your local stuff, start. Query Store is amazing. Query Store does incredible stuff. However, Query Store only aggregates data. It does not detail it. So if you want detailed information, you're looking at extended events. Now, I mentioned earlier a tool that you don't get. <sighs> this is where things get fun. The tool you don't get is Profiler. There is no Profiler. There is no trace. There's no server-side trace. There are no trace events. There's no Profiler. It doesn't exist in the Azure SQL database world. Can't use it. Doesn't work. Sorry. I don't know what to tell you. But that's the key. There is no trace. So you've got extended events. The good news, extended events is better than trace. Extended events is awesome. Extended events is wonderful. Extended events is great. And extended events works inside of Azure and it works pretty well. So we're going to cover that. We're going to walk through all of these and walk through the portal. So let's go ahead and move on and start to play. So I've got a database um, on a server out on Azure. Um, it's very, very tiny, as you can see, um, one gig. And um, that's um, intentional to keep the costs down so that I can run demos and, and do this kind of stuff. Now, the activity that's on it right now is nil, um, no, almost non-existent. Um, but we can generate a little bit of activity and we'll put it together. And this is the basic front end that you're going to see. And the beauty of it is, it shows you immediately DTUs. Get that out of our way. So we can see that this is DTUs, and it shows us the, how many DTUs we're using and on all that fun stuff. Oops. Um, it's right up front. So the very first thing you see is the DTUs in use for the database. Now let's switch back over. Um, we're going to be doing all this live. Um, against Azure. Um, so bear with me if anything goes weird. <laughs> but the basic idea here is, is that any given database runs inside of a server. Any, any given SQL, um, Azure SQL database runs inside of a server. But the servers are mainly management mechanisms. Now one of the management mechanisms it has is right here. I'm going to go to it. I don't have it set up. Um, but this is the elastic pools. And this is where you can set up a pool, um, a pool of, of data resources, and then you pay for a, a, a fixed cost and you just monitor within it. But this is where we can start to look at things like the DTU quota that we could set for a given database or for a pool or for databases within a pool or, 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 et cetera, et cetera. 
But the idea here is, is that you've got information. Now we can take a look and as we know, there's only the one database inside this pool. But that's all the information you really get on the server level. And servers in Azure are much more about a security and management tool, not the instance uh, idea that we worry about when we're talking about on-premises. So separate those two in your mind. You're going to be a lot happier if you keep them apart. So with this, um, one of the things we can do is take a look at the logs. And the log analytics is a tool that works off of your error logs as they are. If we go and look at it, we can just take a look and see if there's any of them that have been run, say run the last hundred calls, um, number of calls by the API. I mean, you can see all the various queries, um, overall latency. Um, so there's all kinds of fun stuff you can get into. And you can look for errors and whatnot inside of it. But the whole key is, is that you want to go down to SQL Database. All right, once we're on SQL Database, everything changes. But you can see average CPU use, performance troubleshooting, um, where there are queries or deadlocks on the system that cause problems. You can run, hit run, it will run a query. It didn't find any logs because we haven't actually had any problems on my system, so there was nothing for it to query against. But you see the idea. It runs a query against the logs and pulls that information back. Let's back up. Oops, hang on. My bad, my bad. Let's just go this way. There we go. You've got a whole bunch of choices, too. You can look at the storage accounts, and you can look at stream analytics jobs if you're doing that kind of thing. Um, but you've got multiple options on what you can do with these things. Mainly, I would stick to the SQL database and stay within this area for the logs. Let's close this. And let's go back to my database. All right. Once we're in here, one of the things we can do is start to set up methods where we pin things and change actually what's on display here. There are ways to modify the monitoring. We also have a number of tools. It can hook into Power BI automatically and better still, we've got performance overview here. So here we can see where I was running some queries earlier, and it used a little bit of CPU. Um, you can see this one where it used the CPU and it did some data movement, and you've got various ways that you can look at them. We can even zoom in on them and get more information, right? So we've got more detailed information showing us closer in time as to how much was used. And obviously, if you can't see it over here, let me just zoom in so you can. It's 1.3%. So we are, my peak here is at 1% of my basic usage. So I'm, I'm running very tiny queries, as you can see. But we can look at broader strokes of time or narrower strokes of time. Either way, um, it gives us a lot of capability to, to, to understand what's going on um, with the system. Now it has performance recommendations. So if there was stuff going on inside your system, it can make those recommendations. You can also see query performance over time. It'll show you what's going on based on the queries. And largely what this is doing, I'm pretty sure, I don't know this for a fact because I don't know the SQL Server internals, but I'm fairly certain this is using um, uh, Query Store to put the information together. But, uh, but I might be wrong about that. Um, Query store is on by default inside your Azure SQL databases. But you can see the resource consuming queries, long running queries, and you can customize a report 
and put things together. So if you can say like, well, hang on, I want to see data IO. Um, I want to see it over the last six hours. Um, I want to see 20 queries, um, you know, and, and you can control things that way. So once we make those changes, it reloads and shows us different information. So we now we've got the data IO for, for multiple queries um, available through the portal there. So there's a lot of options that we have for keeping an eye on the behavior of the system in the portal. And again, I'm not again I'm not going to do it, but you can go and set up Power BI to, to consume this information if you want to. There is the mechanism for um, looking at yeah. There is the mechanism for setting up alerts. So you've got the ability to set up alerts inside of Azure. Not something I'm going to detail today um, because there are multiple different alerting mechanisms that you can set up in Azure and you kind of need to pick and choose what which one you want to do. That's another session entirely we could we could put together is a session on just alerting in Azure. Um, there, there's just so much there that, that it's kind of hard to cover it all. So... Um, the nice thing is, is they've got a nice metric screen. You can build your own report here. Um, line charts, area charts, bar charts. Set it up any way you want to. Um, you can filter them. You can put on multiple charts. Um, build a full custom dashboard out of the information gathered here. So there's a whole lot you can do. Also, they've, they've set it up for um, people with um, vision impairments. So you can, you can change the colors and change the schema to ensure that you're putting in to get, putting together the right stuff. Um, it's pretty cool, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. We're just going to start picking out the metrics. So we're going to look at the standard SQL Server metrics because this is all we're looking at. You can change the scope if you want to um, do more than one database, do the whole server. Um, you've got a lot of choices there. I'm not going to look at that database because that's the master database and who cares. But um, we can add in multiple things if you want to. We're just going to look at the one database for now. Um, because it's only the one database, it's going to use standard metrics. And then the metrics it has are here. And th there are a lot of them. This is where, like I said, the portal gives you a lot of access. There's a lot of control, um, a lot of ways to look at this. And the fact that you can then build it all out into a custom um, a, uh, um, dashboard means that you've got a lot of mechanisms for observing and controlling your system so that you understand what's happening on it. Um, so one of the, my favorite reports is watching Blocked by Firewall to see if there's anybody who's attempted to connect in. Now there isn't any here um, because no one has, but it, it is a, a very useful thing. Um, but there's more. CPU percentage. Again, very much a part of what we're doing um, in terms of keeping an eye on costs. If we're paying through vCPU or even DTU, we want to keep an eye on this. Data I.O. percentage. Um, and it gives you even an idea of what the actual physical metric is. Phys physical data read percent. Um, data space allocated. Data space used. Um, data space used percent. Deadlocks. A count of deadlocks. And then straight up your DTU usage. Let's go ahead and click on DTU. Why not? because we actually know that there's actually some DTU usage that we would see on the chart. And so it's we've set up an area chart. We could set up a bar chart. We could set up a scatter, although a scatter is going to look horrible in this case. Um, yeah, like I said, scatter chart is going to look horrible. Um, or a line chart. Line chart probably makes more sense for this. But again, all we've got to do is click, right? It's not we're clicking on the graph. It shows us. We can change it this way. We can change it that way. And we're changing moments in time, moving forward and backwards. Um, let's see. We can also add multiple metrics. You can um, put more than one metric on the screen. So that's pretty cool. Um, DTU percentage, DTU used. There we go, cool. Failed connections, um, in-memory OLTP storage percentage, um, if you're using in-memory OLTP systems, uh, log IO, 
uh, sessions percentage, successful connections, worker percentage, um, and then SQL Server process core percent, SQL Server process memory percent, um, TempDB, TempDB log, and TempDB percent log used. In short, it's a lot of the stuff you're used to dealing with, right? This isn't, if you know SQL Server at all, and, and Azure not at all, other than the phrase DTU, nothing else should be a surprise in here. Everything should be fairly standard. And so if we have this one metric, we can add another metric, right? Same idea, same approach. Um, let's just say CPU percentage. Um, and let's say max. So now we've got that on the screen. Let's go ahead and minimize this. Um, actually, max looks ugly. Let's switch it back to average. Cool. So now we've got the DTU use down here and the CPU use up here, and you can see where we ran the queries before. So you've got the ability to put all of this together and create a report that's going to give you indications on how things are behaving on, on your Azure SQL database instance. Yes, there's labor involved. Um, but the one thing I would like to point out is what have I done to put together the monitoring of these metrics? And the short answer is nothing. Microsoft has provided all of this. This is all built in. There's no actual labor I've done to set up perfmon or queries or anything else to put this together, mainly because I can't. I can't set up perfmon, right? There's no access to the actual server. So we're running based on what Microsoft has supplied us, but they've supplied us a pretty good percentage of what we need to understand the behavior on the system. So this is exactly what you're gonna be looking for is this type of stuff. And you could put this all together into your own metrics, into your own dashboard and go from there. So that, that much is straightforward. All right, let's take a look at what we can do from a query standpoint. Now this is SysDM DB weight stats. Let's go ahead and fire it off. And this is the weight statistics on my database. Now the question is gonna be immediately, well, okay, weight since when? Well, frankly, it's kind of hard to know. Probably the weights since the last time the database was um, failed over within the three databases that it is, or the last time it failed over through a, uh, um, a geo-replication. But either way, it is a period of time, these are my weights. The, just like we're doing with SysDM OS weights, the real key would be to run the query more than once to see the weights change over time because what's going on before and after is more important than what's going on just collectively. But what's going on collectively is something that we're gonna be able to track. And this is per database. So you would need to run this on each database that you're interested in in order to see the weight statistics going on. Um, can you gather this into a chart someplace? Can you put it through Power BI? Yeah, absolutely. You can do whatever you want to around those, around those types of things. But this is one thing you're going to be looking at. The key is that the process itself, you'll notice, um, and we can run a query against this. So I'll go ahead and put it together. Why not? Um, Now, we can run queries against SysDMOS weight stats. We're going to run against both. We can see it, but what we can't do is interpret it. We can't tell what it's doing. What does it mean, SysDMOS weight stats, here when we're talking about an OS that's outside of our control that is completely doing things that we don't know what it is? So... Will looking at weights here give us meaningful information, actionable information on our system? And the short answer is no. Um, but you can run that query. The main reason I ran it is because I just wanted to show that we've got the same weight types up and down. We've got the waiting task count, so what tasks have been waiting. We've got wait time MS, uh, max wait time MS, and signal wait time MS. So any of the queries that you're used to running in SysDM OS wait stats, cool run them against SysDM DB weight stats, and the behavior is going to be the same. The general idea 
is exactly the same. Which of these weights is causing us the most pain um, and what can we do about it? Nice, simple, straightforward stuff. Now, the next one we want to take a look at is SysDMDB resource stats. Let's go ahead and run it. Oops. There we go. Now this is going to go back in time pretty far because what it's doing is it's collecting the information over quite a long period. Now if you look at it, mine runs back to right now um, 0828 um, and today is 0828 so it's been running for a while. Um, but what it's gathering is a bunch of different data. So let's just drill down on it. Average CPU percent, and you'll notice for different points in time, different CPU percentages. Why? Because it changes over time. Um, the data I.O. percent, the log writes, and you see where we had log writes before. Um, the average memory usage percent. In, in other words, if any of this sounds familiar, this is the stuff that was ex externally available to us on the um, um, portal. So this is where they're exposing this information from. This is where we can go to see it and gather it ourselves. And so we can see max workers, max percentages, the DTU limit that we have, which is five, um, average instant CPU percentage, average um, memory percent, the CPU limit, and the replica role, if any. Um, this is great stuff. This is an easy way for us to query it. So yeah, we can certainly consume it here on the portal, but if we want to put it into some other tool for some other use, we can run queries to retrieve it ourselves. And that's great. That's a great way to pull together the information. Again, this is all about achieving understanding, um, knowing what's going on in our systems. All right, let's keep going. Now the other thing, let me just run this query just so that I can say I ran it. Cool. So the other thing we want to look at is I am connected up to Azure SQL Database here from my management studio. And all of this is running live up to the cloud and back. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, it, you know it looks different. If those of you who have never been into Azure before, it looks different. But a lot of it's still the same. Query Store is still there. Cool. We open up to Query Store and we've got all the Query Store reports. So we can look at, you know, um, top resource consuming queries. And so we will see the queries that are doing the top resource consumption. And none of them are the queries that I ran because um, it's a really tiny query and there's not much data in my database. Um, these are all queries um, probably external from monitoring or from some of the tools that I've got on my system that are connected up and making the um, calls. But you can see that Query Store is behaving like Query Store. There's really kind of, there's not a whole lot to say. It's Query Store. It's running on Azure SQL Database. It's cool. Um, use it. But the, the general concepts are very simple. Query Store is all about understanding what's going on with the queries that you have and um, gathering information about them. Now, the queries that it gathers information about, it aggregates that stuff over time. Now, the question is, over what kind of time? So, let's take a look at the properties of my database. And we can take a look at the properties in the query store. And yeah, you can control query store in Azure SQL Database, just as you can anywhere else. Um, a lot of the defaults are identical. Um, the data flush interval is 15 minutes. Um, the data collection interval is one hour. Um, max plans is 200. These are all standard defaults. Uh, the max size is 10 megabytes. Query store capture mode is auto. Size-based cleanup is auto. Um, and the stale threshold is seven days. So you can make changes to any of these. Um, weight stats capture mode is on. So you've also got the query weight stats captured along with the query metrics. Um, the data is aggregated in the same way. Um, the, the collection interval is one hour, so that's the aggregation interval 
one hour going back in time over seven days with an automatic cleanup. You can make modifications to this if you want to. You can expand the number of days, you can expand the size. It's all based on your systems and your needs. I'm not gonna dictate what you have to do or not do. Um, it's, it's on you, you'll figure it out. All right, so the next thing we wanna look at is extended events. Now I've already set up an extended event session and you can use the GUI. Um, I would recommend writing the T-SQL and then using the T-SQL as a command, but you can use the GUI. Um, this will come up here in just a second. Remember, it's going up to the cloud, coming back down live, real time. Man, it's taking its time. Come on. This thing's slow locally sometimes, but man, it's killing me here. Look at that. Let's just go to the event, see if we can get that running quicker. Wow. Okay, well, in theory, ah, there it goes. Woo! All right, cool. So, most of the setup is the same. The using extended events locally versus using extended events on Azure, it's mostly the same. Um, you've got the um, extended event itself. Um, you give it a name. You can use a template or not. Uh, you define um, how it, if it starts up on, at session startup, you can turn on causality tracking if you want to. You can then define the events that you want. I've defined mine, um, RPC and SQL batch complete. You build it per database, so you don't need to put in database filters. You don't need to ensure that, oh gosh, I only want to capture for this database. Well, no, you're only capturing on this database, so you don't need to worry about that. You can also define data storage. Now, right now, I've not defined data storage. So what's that mean? That means that it's only doing it in memory. Um, it's, it's, um, it's still capturing everything. We'll be able to see it here in a second. But um, you can add targets. Targets you can add, there's only a few of them. It's not the normal stuff, which is a shame because the one thing that they're missing um, is um, the histogram. And I would really love to have histogram. But instead, it's ring buffer or memory, um, the event file, or an event counter. You can put out to one of those three, and off you go. Um, event file, you have to know, is going to Azure Storage. Okay? Nothing tricky, nothing special, nothing, oh my god. It, but, you know, it's, it's out there on the cloud, so it has to go out on the cloud, and that's where it works. Um, no big deal. Once it's up, once it's set up, let's go ahead and... Get out of my way. Once it's there, you can use, um, you can't watch live data. <laughs> Sorry. Um, disappointing, I know. But what you can do is query it through the XML. You can use XPath queries and query it. Or better still, do what I do, export it out to a file on Azure and then open the file in Azure inside of live data and take a look at the window that way. Um, then that way you can use the live data. But otherwise you have to run X queries or use um, DBA tools. DBA tools is great. Um, so that's another way to do it. All right, so that's the sessions that we wanted to cover. We covered the queries, query store, extended events, and the portal. Awesome. Let's switch back to our slides. Now, hopefully, we hit the goals today and talked about the things that you want to talk about in terms of um, Azure. Um, we've walked through the tools that we were using, we've walked through the mechanisms of gathering information, and we talked about the types of information and why you would want to gather this stuff. Um, this is my contact information again, one more time. Um, if you would like to get in touch with me after today, ask me any questions, I love questions. Um, they are air and water to me, and um, I need both to live. So please, please ask me questions. Um, let's see, that's it. This is SQL Bits. Um, love SQL Bits. Very excited to get to take part in it again. Um, hopefully next year I'll be there in person and we'll talk. That's it. Thanks a lot. My name is Grant Fritchie. I work for Redgate Software.